Okay, live keeps kicking me off. I hope this will work finally. I switched the Wi-Fi to our actual home instead. Um, I'm Ashley from Profoundly Paranormal. Today I'm going to be taking you guys through the history of Bonnie and Clyde, all of the research and stuff that I've done over the past few months, and just from a lifetime of kind of being fascinated by them. Hey, Delmi. Um, I'm also going to show you guys the video afterwards of the end of the line. <laughs> no, it was just acting really weird, so I had to restart it. Hey, guys. I'm going to wait for a little bit and let everybody else kind of come in before we start. That way I don't have to go back because this is not necessarily long. Hi, little ones. It's not necessarily long. Hey, Aunt Sherry. But it is pretty detailed. Um, I went and had made sure because I know that a lot of you guys actually watch with your kids, which is pretty awesome. I love the fact that you're letting them see this or at least be interested in it. And hi, trying to help them understand instead of just letting them be afraid. But I made sure I went through and as much as I could with their history, um, kind of make it G or PG rated more so, I guess, because you can't really make their history G rated. Hey guys, I'm just going to wait for everybody else to kind of come in. I know I had a little bit of extra time in between because Lai was acting crazy. Hey Alex, hey Jenna, if you guys have any questions that you want me to ask while I'm at the Ambush Museum and while I'm at their marker, please, hey Dan, go ahead and let me know. Hey Paul, um, if you guys have something personal that you want to ask them, maybe not necessarily something that you want everybody else to see, go ahead and message it to me. Otherwise, I'm going to be compiling a list and doing a session strictly from questions that I've gotten from either a profoundly paranormal page or people personally asking, you know, can you ask these questions. Um, Sheremy actually at one point asked if I thought that they had any buried treasure or to ask if they had any treasure buried anywhere. And after all this research and everything, I really don't think that they did because with as much as they gave to their family, the state that they left them in when they passed, I don't think that they would have just hid the treasure. I'm pretty sure they would have given it to the family. And they even had trouble paying for two separate headstones. So, I mean, they obviously didn't have very much money. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start just reading through the history of Bonnie and Clyde. Some people asked if I could just record this or post it for tomorrow because I have a lot of the followers that we have over in England or Europe. Hey, Alex. So without further ado, here is the history of Bonnie and Clyde. I'm not going to be looking at you too much because I am actually reading what I wrote. So can you guys hear everything okay? Everything good? Yeah. Good. Hi, Miss Kim. It is crazy. They had no money. They buried Clyde and his brother Buck with the same headstone because they didn't have enough money for two. So, everybody can hear? We're good to go? Awesome. So, the tragic tale of these two law-breaking lovers was so wild that for almost four years, they were just thought of as a novelty story. It wasn't until 1933 when the infamous photos we recognize them by now were found at a crime scene and law enforcement officers were finally able to put together their countywide crime spree. The police released these photos and they became an overnight sensation. Hey Caleb! Hey little buddy! They became an overnight sensation and were even rooted for by many to take it... <coughs> Pardon, to make it unscathed because let's face it, everyone loves a good story about star-crossed lovers. With many lives taken, numerous robberies under their belt, and after a point seemingly taunting law enforcement to capture them, they soon became as infamous as Babyface, Nelson, John Dillinger, and other scandalous members of the La Cosa Nostra. But what drove these two individuals together to form an extremely rare and dangerous dynamic? Was there really an end goal in all of their madness, or were they just doomed sweethearts destined for destruction? 
Knowing that there would be no trial, no jail, only death on sight, did they simply get tired of running, or were they ready to spend an eternity just looking over their shoulders? Clyde Chestnut Barrow was born in Teleco, Texas to Henry and Kimi Barrow on March 24, 1909. One of seven children, Clyde Chestnut Barrow always knew nothing but poverty and crime. With their farm too expensive to keep, hey cat, they moved into the Devil's Back Porch, a rundown marsh community on the Trinity River right outside of Dallas. Being right across from the big city, Clyde always yearned for more in life. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I'm kind of sick. And he was determined to get the lifestyle that he wanted by any means necessary. His big brother Buck, who was already a proficient car thief, served as a huge influence in gearing towards crime. By the time he was 17, he worked his way up from stealing chickens to armed robbery. Cat, stop. In a way, he was a pioneer in regards to vehicular robbery as this was the first era of cars that had electric starter systems and were significantly easier to jumpstart than modern vehicles. Buck taught him the cat wants to be famous. <laughs> Buck taught him and he very quickly mastered the art. At only 20 years old, he was already well known by the local police for his heisting habits and in November 19th, 29, Clyde Buck and another friend robbed an auto shop in Denton, Texas. Spotted by the police, they opened fire, clipped Buck, and incarcerated him. Clyde and their friend got away, and they had to run home back on foot, which, where they were living from Denton, is probably a good, like, 30 or 40 miles, so they ran for a good while. Spotted by the police... Oh, I'm sorry. I just went back there. Cat, stop. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker who was born in the tiny town of Rowena, Texas, on October 1st, 1910, to Charles and Emma Parker. Her father passed away when she was only four years old. And not able to afford the children and their house, Emma moved to her family into a small neighborhood in West Dallas. Although they didn't have much, Emma Parker always pushed for the best for her children. Bonnie not only excelled academically, she was also a wonderful singer, dancer, and a marvelous poet. She, however, always wanted more, like the glamorous life that she saw in the Hollywood movies. She frequently, she frequently went to the Washington House Theater, which is actually right across the river here in Dallas still. And in 1926, Bonnie dropped out at the age of 15 to marry Roy Thornton, who was a very well-known criminal and actually was more geared towards, um, he had a penchant for robbery. So here lies a factor that most don't take into consideration when they blame Clyde for influencing her or introducing her to that life of larceny. She even had the name of Roy tattooed on the inside of her thigh, which was considered absolutely damnable and inappropriate for a woman in the 1920s. Um, you, even just showing skin was scandalous, so the fact that she tattooed a man's name on the inside of her thigh was pretty crazy back then. Caught in a whirlwind romance, fueled by ridiculous Hollywood notions of grand love, she falls victim to abuse and abandonment. Hey guys. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> oh. When Roy left and never came back. Forlorn, waiting, and losing hope, Wondering when some grand adventure would come across her path, her prayers answered on January 5th, 1930. What, that it's scandalous now to get it tattooed? I mean, not as much. They probably would have, like, branded her back then. Now we can get tattoos where we want. But that, especially in the 1920s, for her to get a tattoo right there, that had to have been done not by somebody who was a professional. That was probably done by Roy with, like, a pen and ink or a needle and ink by himself at home that probably was not professionally done because nobody would have done that to a woman back in the 1920s same reason she wasn't um prosecuted for anything that they did nobody believed that a woman was po was capable of doing any of this that i'll actually get to that that's pretty insane she never gets tried prosecuted anything so 
let's go ahead and write. So, um, I just went ahead and gave you guys, like JP's tattoo, the eight or the dice or whatever it was, the A <laughs> in the inside, I remember that. Um, so this part I entitled The Day Gasoline Minutes Match because from there, hey Wanda, from there I, it was just a chain reaction of emotion of everything that you could possibly think of their story has. I mean, when you think of star-crossed lovers, you guys think of Romeo and Juliet, but they were 15 and 16 years old. Not to say that they weren't really that much older, but they were living in the real world. They saw the world around them as not necessarily not fair, but they knew that the only way to get out was through crime. At least Clyde did, and Bonnie just always wanted the bad girl life. She must have really loved Roy. I don't think she necessarily loved Roy. I think he was that grand notion that she thought about. I think that he was, hey Joe, <laughs> okay Sophia, you go pee. Um, I think that, again, he was the grand notion. I think that he was the epitome of everything she dreamed of. I believe that all those Hollywood movies that she watched with the bad boy that came and swept her off her feet, I believe that that's what she thought he was for her. And Roy was not that. He was a criminal, sure, but he wasn't a loving husband at all. And it's funny because back then, again, getting divorced even was considered horrible. Hey, Joe, was considered absolutely horrible and not accepted. No, it was rarely ever heard of. Her and Roy actually were never divorced, never divorced. She wore his wedding ring on her finger until she died. Somebody actually tried to steal it off of her body when they got shot down. Um, they tried to steal a lot off of them. Okay, we'll get back to that though. So, and yeah, Alex, to answer it, no, I don't think she really loved Roy. She loved Clyde, and that is all incredibly clear after we go through this. You'll see that, I mean, she had multiple chances to leave, multiple especially early on in the bit very beginning she had a chance to go and she just didn't don't we all do that to a man put all that on his shoulders and they just dis disappoint <laughs> good for nothing that's why we got to find bad boys like clyde <laughs> um he actually begged her all the time to stay and to stay with her family to stop because he didn't want that life for her he loved her but he loved her enough to let her go, which I think said more about his character than it would have been that he never tried to get her to stay, that he was perfectly fine with putting her in danger like that all of the time. Yeah, see, it makes more sense that way, right? <laughs> all right, so the day gasoline met its match. This is pretty much from the point that they met until they passed. So on January 5th, 1930. After waiting to be swept away in another bigger-than-life adventure, Bonnie Elizabeth was instantly beguiled by the bad boy Barrow. With a sharp suit and a brand new stolen car and a wicked smile, it was then gasoline met its match. And there sparked a vicious wildfire of their love, greed, and unsparing nature, unstoppable for four years. However, only weeks after dating, two weeks to be exact, it was almost exactly two weeks to the day that they had started dating, Clyde, Dallas police actually picked up Clyde at Bonnie's home on a warrant and took him to Waco to await trial. She had a chance very early on to cut ties with them and move on. Knowing what life and love with a criminal was like, like she, she knew already what was going to happen. She knew that there was never going to be any stability in this. She knew that it was it had the possibility of end, ending up like it did with Roy. She knew that this was going to be a man that was going to be away, wasn't going to be present when she needed him most because he was incarcerated, because of the things he does, because of the choices he makes. But by all accounts, Bonnie and Clyde had the most electric connection, and you could feel it just by being in the same room with them. 
everybody that they've ever interviewed that have been around this couple that have seen them together they all had that to say about them that there was something so magnetic between them that you could feel the spark in the air when they were together <clears throat> not only does she not leave him she also agrees to help him escape she is such a ride or die now keep in mind this is actually where like where the term comes from that ride or die term that hi maria that ride or die term comes from bonnie and clyde you're gonna ride with me or you're you're gonna die because they thought that anybody back then especially with the barrow gang if you squealed they thought they murdered you it was insane but i mean she stuck to her guns only two weeks after meeting him mind you hey um and she helped him escape prison he wrote her a note and gave her the whole full escape plan and she smuggled a gun in on the visit he would then use it to hold up the officers on duty shooting at them as they fled the scene and seven days later in ohio they were captured along with another inmate that helped barrow escape where this is the Bonnie and Clyde story. So this was actually in Waco, Texas, where Bonnie helped Clyde escape from jail. He was awaiting trial there. And when she went to go visit him, she smuggled in a gun. And he used, where in Ohio? I'm not sure. I didn't look that far into it. I just remember that it was Ohio. Ohio was where they escaped to. And they actually captured them 14 days later. Um, and Clyde was sent to Eastham Prison Farm, which was, it's about four hours away from Dallas. And Bonnie was just sent back to Dallas to live with her mom. Again, another, yeah, um, another, well, the first instance where she actually gets caught with them and nothing happens to her. This is one of many, because keep in mind, nobody thought that a woman was capable of doing any of this. And that's where everybody was wrong because she had that mentality. She wanted to be a gangster. She wanted that life. She wanted to make sure that she was raw in life. She didn't want to be a quiet, timid woman. She She wanted to stir things up. She wanted to be strong in a time where women were supposed to be weak. While at Eastham Prison Farm, aptly named Bloody Ham, Clyde is subjected to inhumane treatments that were perfectly acceptable back then in our penal systems. Forced to work in deplorable conditions, a majority dead or in the hospital because of it. Only given a cup of water and a piece of bread for sustenance and beaten every day just because they were seen as nothing, simply property of the state. Barrow saw the very darkest in humanity here. Being a 13,000 acre system with the most heinous and violent offenders and a small man, only 5'6 and 130 pounds. Keep in mind, Clyde Barrow ended up, they said by the time he was 16, I believe it was, he was 5'6 and 130 pounds. He never got heavier than that the rest of his life. So 5'6 is not big and 130 pounds is not big. But he was he was fierce his size did not matter he was continuously though assaulted by a particularly nasty inmate named ed crowder standing at six foot tall and over 200 pounds there seemed to be no hope for barrel he was assaulted in every way possible by this man since the kids are watching i'll let you figure out what that means but um for years um it it's it's actually pretty sad because in this you'll see that everything that happened to him while he was in prison shaped the way he ended up becoming which i feel that's the way in a lot of our criminal systems you know we sit there and we lock people up for certain crimes when they're so young instead of rehabilitating and we actually create worse criminals because we're introducing and we're introducing them to the worst of the worst and then expecting them to come out better people that makes no sense to me. Um, 
Finally, on October 29th, on 1931, he reached his breaking point. After luring, luring Crowder back to an empty restroom area, he cracked his head open with a pipe that he found in a construction equipment pile as one of the buildings was being renovated nearby. What part was crazy? We'll address that before I go on any further. Preach or they have no chance and they get out. Exactly. We don't we don't care about the criminals, we care about the money. Because so long as the prisons are filled, the money is coming in. Now, if we were to sit there and rehabil rehabilitate these people to the point where they never came back, without repeat offenders, do you know how much money prisons and jails would make? Not very much. It's called recidivation, being recidivized. That's actually a term. You get so accustomed to the jail lifestyle that you know nothing else. It's just a mentality that you live in. Like, even when you're out in the free world, you could be a free person. But you still act like you're in prison. It's pretty insane. Um. Oh, so he, yeah, he cracked his skull open. But the craziest part... Hello, Rod. Exactly, Sherry. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't even charged with the murder of this inmate, though. So he cracked his head wide open. It was pretty horrible and gruesome. He didn't even get charged with the murder. Another inmate instead took the fall for it, but he was already um, serving a life sentence. So my only conclusion as to why somebody would do that is take the blame for someone else, I mean, regardless of whether or not you have a life sentence, is that this man, Ed Crowder, was not only assaulting Clyde, he was probably the worst of the worst in there. He was probably assaulting everybody. And this particular inmate that ended up taking the fall for him probably felt so in gratitude to what Clyde finally did because nobody else had. That he was like, you know what? I'll take it. I'm going to be in here for the rest of my life anyway. Right? I mean, that makes sense to me. I wouldn't take the fall for something I didn't do, even if I was in there for life. No. Um, yeah, so what happened to Clyde? He didn't get, he didn't get charged with it. But I mean, even though he wasn't going through any type of mental or physical abuse anymore, or from Ed Crowder, he was still going through it just on a daily basis by being in that prison, by being out in the work fields. And keep in mind, they'd keep them out in the work fields for at least like 14, 15 hours a day until they just couldn't move anymore. Um, okay, so we're going to start off again. Hey, Mason. So, free from physical abuse, he was still stuck behind the physical bars. And after years of physical, mental, and sexual abuse, he could no longer bear the conditions. Came to see ghosts, where are they? It's just the history of Bonnie and Clyde so far. Um, I will be doing the investigation Saturday, so you can see the ghost Saturday. So we're going to start over again. Um, yeah, so he couldn't bear it anymore, basically. He just was completely tired of everything. He was... I know you guys can imagine you get to the point where you can't function. Imagine being in this situation added on top of that it wasn't just being in that system it was being physically abused constantly by everybody that he was surrounded with it was him being with and keep in mind Eastham was they held the worst offenders Eastham prison was where they sent the murderers the killers and they sent somebody there who was just guilty of robbery so you can see where he, he wasn't on that level of crime yet. When you, when you introduce them to this lifestyle, when you incorporate them with these types of people, what do you expect them to come out as? Perfectly fine citizens? They're going to come out as killers. They're around killers. They have to fight for themselves. They're going to come out as killers. <coughs> oh, pardon me. All right. So, he... he did not want to do this anymore. He was done. He didn't want to be out in the field. He couldn't take it. He actually asked one of his fellow inmates to take an axe and chop off two of his toes. That way he didn't have to go out into the fields anymore. 
Um, <laughs> and the funniest thing about this is, though, that as he was sitting in the infirmary, freshly recovering, and I mean, when I say freshly, he was like a day into his recovery from his toes being chopped off. Um, <laughs> they actually pardoned him because that was very, very common back then was pardoning. They went around and did it constantly because of the overcrowding in jails. He stacks. So the overcrowding in jails made it easier for pardons to come through all of the time, or at least not necessarily go through the judicial process that you have to go through now. His mother went before a judge, um, asked for a pardon, and pretty much got it because there was overcrowding at Eastham, and they wanted to make room for the worst offenders. But by this point, they had already created something completely different in Clyde. They'd changed him into a completely different person. So, I mean, I don't know why nothing was done sooner, honestly. Um, I'm going to get back. So, sorry, I get going on my own thing and I lose where I am. Okay, so, on February 2nd, 1932, he was released, although he was not the same Clyde Barrow that went in. A fellow inmate, hey Debbie, Ralph Fultz, said, and this was a direct quote from him, this is another inmate that was in there with him the entire time, um, I saw Clyde Barrow change from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake right in front of my eyes. Barrow even proclaimed after getting out of Eastham, I'm never going back to jail, they'll have to kill me first. The timing of his release could not have been more fortuitous, as there was a new breed of criminals abound now. The mafia and the cutthroat mentality that they had was enticing to all, but was incredibly inspiring to these lovebirds. And in a time where the government is the bad guys, the depression is full force, and the oppression of the people, it made them all support the ne'er-do-well Robin Hood types. You keep in mind, you think back on the mob days, you know, in the early 30s and stuff, how many people in the community actually rooted for the people in the mob? They wanted them to succeed. They wanted them to get away because they were the ones giving back to the communities. They were the ones taking from the big guy and giving to the small. And that's exactly what they people thought Bonnie and Clyde were doing. And, I mean, it was a love story. So when you have a love story and murder and guns and robbery and all that, crazy Hollywood pizzazz. I mean, that's just a recipe for infamy, which again, till this day, everybody knows who they are. It doesn't matter your age. You, you know, that reference, you know who they are by some way, shape or form. Hello, Jason. Peaky blinders. <laughs> um, I can't wait for that new season. We're going to go ahead and get started again. So, after a botched robbery, Bonnie, now 21, was apprehended as Clyde got away, and she was put into a holding cell in Kaufman, Texas. And that's actually where I ended up stopping the other night, guys, was right outside of Kaufman. Give me a second, I'm looking for my charger. <laughs> um, that's actually where I stopped, was right outside of Kaufman, where they held up one of the stores out there and got arrested. And that road that I was on live the other night is actually the road that was originally used that Clyde took out of Kaufman when he escaped. This particular instance, and let me know how you guys feel about this one, because I, I'm pretty sure nobody knows, or at least a lot of people don't know this about them. So, um, let me get a little further down real quick so I'm not having to go back and forth. Just bear with me one second, guys. Hi, everybody else that I haven't seen or gotten to. Hello, Jason. Hello, Debbie. Hello, Stax. Alrighty. Okay. So, after the botched robbery, now 21, um, she was apprehended and Clyde got away. She was putting in, put into the holding cell in Kaufman, Texas. And by this time, though, everyone, including her own mother, saw a change, and even her poems showed a dramatic shift in her mentality. She wanted to be living this lifestyle, and she wanted to be the gangster gal, and she actually wrote that in her poems, that one of her poems, she wrote that that was the life of a gangster gal, to always be around and never give in. 
as she wrote herself, yes. So, I need glasses too, guys. <laughs> Where was that? In June, she was finally set free. Not believing. It's a cat. In June, she was finally set free because they did not believe a woman was, and this is an actual quote from when she was released, they did not think that a woman would willingly commit crime. She got away with it for not only the first time. Now, this is the second time that she has been caught with him. She was actually caught in the middle of this robbery this time and was still not prosecuted at all. Not even put to trial. They just pretty much dismissed him. We're like, no, a woman's not going to commit crime willingly. He must have made her do it. And they sent her back up to Dallas. My cat, <laughs> he scares me all the time when he does that. That's why I had to put this here because he likes to jump in and out of the screen. They don't know me. Right. I mean, how many, but that's again, how many serial killers that are women and how many just criminals that are women do we know of nowadays that it's not as crazy a thought. And do you know why it's not as crazy a thought that women can be like that? Because of Bonnie. Because of Bonnie Parker. Before that, women were not seen as a threat. They weren't seen as strong enough to have their own free will, to think on their own, to form rational thoughts. She was more of a gangster than Clyde was, honestly. Clyde was just running because he knew he could never stop. She chose to go because she loved that lifestyle. Up until a certain point, though, at the end. Um, but yeah, she did not... She didn't... It's just appalling to me that she got off so many times. Because again, this isn't the first... This is the second time. But this also is not the last time. Nowhere near the last time. <laughs> right. Um, so... Just days later, after she got sent back to her mother's, this is where they set out on a 24-state robbing spree. They went across 24 states robbing grocery stores, banks, gas stations, with, what, with help from what became known as the Barrow Gang, an interchanging group of ex-cons. So if one of the people in their group would die, they would just go and find another con from the nearest jail and have them come along. This was not about people that they knew. Now keep in mind, from time to time, there were family members of theirs that interchanged throughout it, but for the most part, it was all just ex-cons, and this is where it got them in the end, that they just trusted just any old Joe that they found in prison. That did not bode well for them, because everybody knows some people are snitches, and you don't trust them. I wouldn't trust prisoners with my personal business they did too much um so <clears throat> for some reason they only stole enough money to get where they were going next and they often aimed for places they didn't think they'd be known hello timothy barrow told his mother hello all of the money in the world wouldn't make me free he was just interested in making it through day by day alive and not behind bars that was his only concern now keep in mind we already went through everything that he went through in prison so you can understand then his drive his mentality that no matter what you do to me i am never going to go back to that place i'm never going to be not not a joke like that just so you know what i mean um that mentality that he had he was so terrified, and keep in mind, this was years of sexual abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, that he probably had some type of post-traumatic stress disorder from this to the point where he feared it so much that he was going to do anything and everything possible, including kill to stay free, to never have to go through that again. After the Ford Flathead V8s came out, Clyde's business was booming. As he only stole... Hello, Jordan. As he only stole the best of the best and 
his getaway vehicle was unmatched by any of the other police model cars that were out at the time, so it made escapes a breeze. Now, keep in mind, this was before the police forces around the U.S. changed their cars out for those actual Ford V8s, which is what they started using, to apprehend people like Barrow, who were car thieves or who were, I guess, not necessarily rich, but had more money to obtain these cars, which were usually criminals. Usually criminals, especially back in this day, were the only ones who had enough money to actually buy these cars. So you're always getting outran by the criminals because you have the crappy old model, but, you know, the robbers got the new fancy V8s, so <laughs> a lot more horsepower in that one. Um, yeah, they did. Um, there were, I can't even tell you how many accounts at this point that I've ran through of policemen talking about what it was like to actually try and catch up with Clyde. It was insane. They constantly referred to him as either a rocket or a jet or, um, I'll even get to it at one point. Somebody refers to him as a snake, like how a snake coils and then attacks. They actually compare him to that at certain points. Ted Hinton, who was actually one of the Dallas sheriffs that helped gun down the duo, here it is, described Clyde's driving as such. It looked like a snake coil up on you and then launch a hundred feet. After four corners, forget it. You're not going to find him. He's gone. And keep in mind, Ted Hinton, the, one of the Dallas sheriffs that actually shot him down, was the father of the gentleman who opened up the ambush museum that I'm going to be doing the lockdown this weekend at. So, could you imagine a museum opened up by the family of the people who shot you down as pretty much a tourist attraction for your death, for your tragedy? They say that they have the reports that I've gotten so far from the people that own the place as to what happens in there. I'd be mad too. You can tell there's something in there and I'm kind of hoping it's them honestly. I do hope that they've passed over but I hope that they're spirits. And the difference between that is a spirit has passed over already, has passed on, but chooses to come back to our plane. They, they have the ability to cross back and forth. Um, and we'll get into that later too, the difference between the two, because somebody asked me that earlier, so I'll go ahead and ask that as answer that as well. I'm sorry. So, even though Clyde was proficient at driving, he always prepared for war, including his Browning automatic rifle, and he was stocked with armor-piercing bullets that he stole from National Guard armories. So keep in mind, he was not like any other criminal in that day. He was still... I'm excited for Saturday, too. Clyde Barrow not only had the top-of-the-line cars that he could sit there and get away from police like that, he had armories. He he went to the National Guard armories and stole a ridiculous amount. And this wasn't even in just one state. He would hit the armories in almost every state that they went to. Keep in mind, this is 24 states that they went through committing crimes. He got armor-piercing bullets, automatic rifles, assault guns. I mean, just their armory alone that they had personally on them was insane. So much so to the point that they actually, when um, they got gunned down, after actually even a certain point, about a year before they got gunned down, they changed the weapons that they were giving law enforcement because of these guys, because they were coming at them so heavily every single time that they didn't stand a chance. So the law enforcement in the U.S. actually had to step up their weaponry game just to match gunpowder with these guys. <laughs> April 1932 through January 1933, Clyde Barrow killed four men, Eugene Moore of Stringtown, Oklahoma, Doyle Johnson, who was shot down in front of his family in Temple, Texas. He was a gas station um, attendant, if I'm remembering correctly, who they were trying to rob a car 
he had a, he actually had nothing to do with what they were doing. He was robbing a car, and they um, he just interfered and tried to stop him with the weapon. He actually approached Clyde with a shotgun, and Clyde opened fire on him first. You know, eat or be eaten in this world to them. Um, he shot a Fort Worth deputy, Malcolm Davis, and with a shot in the chest, shotgun, with the shotgun at point blank range. And then there was a fourth man that was unnamed. But this is what makes me skeptical is that there were so many things that were attributed to them. They were given credit for a lot of crimes, murder, rape. They were actually accused of rape at one point. Um, all these crazy, insane things that they actually didn't do. And Bonnie even addresses it multiple times that, you know, you make us out to be bigger than we are. You give us more credit than we're due. And that was a very big part of their downfall was because all of these stories were being attributed to them. They had to be taken down one way or another. You know, you couldn't just sit there and have law enforcement be like, oh, we're, we're, we'll ignore it. Because at a certain point, they got, they got too big for their britches. They were known everywhere. They were known all across the U.S., overseas. They were known for being criminals, even though they honestly really weren't compared to all the other people that were around. It's insane. Hello, Joseph. Um, hello, guys. So, we're going to go through, and we just went through the rest of the history. After this post on live, you guys can go back and get what you missed. But now we're kind of nearing towards the end of their story. Um, I'm going to go through and give you guys just a little bit more of their actual crimes together, but then wrap it up. And again, after this, you guys can come to the watch party. I would like you to join the watch party after this for the end of the line video that I made. So... All right. When asked by his sister how he felt now that he's killed so many, he replied, and keep in mind, I want, I want to know your thoughts right after this. I'll stop. Would you have ever thought this to come out of the mouth of Clyde Barrow after everything that we've seen in the media, how we, were, how we grew up learning about him or how we grew up... Um, with the notions of how ruthless or cold that they were. Would you have ever expected a man like that to say this? When she asked how many or how he felt now that he's killed so many, he said, sick to my stomach. I've got guns. They're trying to kill me and I'm just trying to get away. I feel bad I had to take a human life, but it was them or me. Would you have ever expected those words to come out of the mouth of what police and the media made to be like the most ruthless and cold-blooded killer of our time well not necessarily of our time but you know hardcore criminal wise absolutely ruthless was what they were made out to be that they they spared no one they destroyed everything in their wake which actually isn't true and is provable on several accounts if ever they were met by law enforcement with Without weapons or without the weapons already drawn on them in a situation that they could get out of easily what they would do is just kidnap hey Nance they would just kidnap the policemen and then release them like 50 60 miles down the road but always release them they only killed when they were being shot at first that's something that nobody ever puts into reports they only ever used force when force was being used upon them first. They didn't just go out being like, oh, you're in the way, I'm going to shoot you down, boom, boom, boom. They never did that. They took many hostages, many, and always released them perfectly fine. Never harmed them once. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and get back to it then. So, eventually... Hey guys, just give me one second. We're going to go over here real quick. I have to answer something back before. Okay, hold on one second.
Okay, guys. So, anybody who's joining us, we've already sat there and gone through most of their history. You guys can catch up after this post and publishes live. Hello, Zachary. Um, we're going through the history of Bonnie and Clyde. This is more towards the end of their story. Hey, Kiki. <laughs> so, now we've already gone through all of the people that they killed, or at least that Clyde killed, throughout um, April 1932 towards January 1933. And we're going to go through kind of their personal lives at this point. So we just saw that he has remorse. He, he's not cold-blooded. They're not as bad as everybody else makes them out to be. And they are incredibly family-centric. They love their family so much that on, I can't even count how many occasions it was, they risked everything to go back to Dallas and see them. They went back all the time and always to give money and gifts. What Clyde would do is sneak into town right outside of the area that they lived in and he'd leave a Coke bottle with a message inside of it um, to make sure that the coast was cleared for them to come into town. And they meet up at a random park somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Dallas or in surrounding areas to have a picnic. And it wasn't just Clyde's family or Bonnie's family. It was both of their families together. So even though they weren't married, their families came together just as if they were joined. They came together to have these feasts. Um... Clyde's mom actually used to make a huge spread and would do the same thing every time. Fried chicken, cornbread, mac and cheese, okra, collard greens. Just like a whole huge spread to feed everyone. And she would do it every single time they came into town. <clears throat> so, like I said earlier though in the very beginning, Clyde actually begged Bonnie to stay every single time. As did her mother, as did the rest of her family. They always asked her to stay. Sorry, guys, my hand's getting a little tired from holding this. Oh. Um, yeah, but she, she refused. Every single time, she refused. She never once took them up on that offer, and she was always by his side. Even when he left her, and she got captured, and he didn't. I mean, she understood what it meant to be a part of that life, and she knew that she had to take her time and just deal with it she was not gonna say anything about him she wasn't gonna incriminate him she never gave him up and they still let her go um so right after they started visiting their family more frequently in dallas after all this happened buck his older brother that we discussed in the very beginning um he escaped or he didn't escape from jail he was actually released and then he and his wife, Blanche, became part of the Barrow Gang, along with um, W.D. Jones. And you never learned any of this before. Well, that's why I'm doing it now, because, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I thought I knew a lot about them until I started researching them more thoroughly, not just going off of, you know, what I read in books or, you know, at least the books that exaggerate their life. Um watching documentaries or movies on them and stuff, you know, it's nothing like how we thought of them. And I'm so glad to have this opportunity because I feel like when I actually get to the museum, I'm going to be able to hopefully bring peace to them and what happened because I don't think that they were... They didn't deserve that. I don't think that they deserve the end because, especially when we get towards the end, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Their death was overkill, literally. Hey, Janine. Um, so everybody who's watching now and wasn't here before, we're just going through the very end stages of the Bonnie and Clyde history. Um, so while they were in Joplin, Missouri, trying to rest, they were brazen and picking a known bootlegging town. And it was often rampant with cops. Finally, when the local policemen showed up and decided to check out their hideout after they were spotted, they were no match for the Barrow's gang firepower. The Barrow gang's firepower. Sorry, I'm tired too. 
So John Harriman, who was actually only a part-time police officer, which I don't understand why if they thought that it was the Barrow Gang, they would send a part-time police officer, somebody who, he, he wasn't even a police officer, he was just a peace officer, mind you. So he was just there pretty much as a volunteer. Why would you send a volunteer to go and try and apprehend these criminals? Makes no sense to me. But he was actually shot dead on sight. After they opened fire on them, they opened fire back like they always do. And he died on the scene. But police Harry McGinnis, his arm was actually shot almost completely off. And he passed later that same day. They were using their um, rifles and their shotguns at such close range with him that in the picture you only actually see like this part of his arm is still attached right here and like that's it the rest of it is pretty mangled he passes away um later that day <coughs> pardon so um but they were so caught off at that point caught off guard that they left everything behind they left their clothes they left their jewelry they left their weapons they left um undeveloped film rolls too and that's actually where they got those pictures that we know them of. Have you guys ever seen the pictures of Bonnie and Clyde where she's holding the gun to his chest or where she's holding the gun and smoking a cigar or he's um, kneeled down in front of the car with the gun? That's actually the raid where they found those pictures and processed them. So those pictures weren't, weren't even released by Bonnie and Clyde themselves. Those were actually released by the police in order to... Um, apprehend them to get anybody to give tips about their whereabouts so you know facial recognition you put their na face on every paper call us if you have a tip but it backfired on them because most people actually rooted for him and didn't say a word when they came into their town everybody pretty much stayed silent just let them go about their business the only people trying to stop them was law enforcement um <clears throat> But this also did bring a certain degree of notoriety, especially with law enforcement, again. So they were never able to stop. In June 1933, outside of Wellington, Texas, Clyde made a terrible error in driving, and he does not see a detour on the road ending up ahead. It's ending as he tries to stop. The car actually turns and flips over multiple times and catches fire. And even though he was thrown from the car, everybody escaped with their lives, but Bonnie had such a bad, what was it, her left or right leg? Her left leg. She um, was so badly maimed from a burn injury on her left leg that she was actually considered crippled for the rest of her life. She walked with a very bad limp. She couldn't put full weight on that side. And their getaways on foot at one point, right after this actually, um, ended with the apprehension of the rest of their gang because Clyde ended up having to carry her throughout the rest of it. So um, the police actually came to try and investigate this accident. And when they came, this is another instance of where they did not take lives. They spared them. They were not as ruthless as everybody said that they were. Um, they actually the two officers that were there and responded to the scene, they just tied them up, put them in the back seat, took off with their car, and then, <laughs> hey guys, and then they dropped them off about 50 miles outside of town from where they were. So again, another instance where they could have sat there and killed, but they do not kill until they are threatened. They don't just take lives. They're not as ruthless as everybody makes them out to be. This was about, at this point through my um, research, this was the, I want to say, sixth instance where I actually saw that they didn't take lives. Hey, cat. They didn't take lives. They saved lives. And unless you were coming at them shooting, they weren't going to shoot back at you. And, I mean, that's it's pretty fair to ask. Don't shoot at me. I won't shoot at you. <laughs> um, we're towards the end of this guys so if you've missed it so far you can go back and catch the rest when it's published 
And then right after this, I'm going to be hosting the watch party for the end of the line video that I made for you guys. Hey, Miss Pam. Hey, Dave. Hey, Justin. So, so she leaves. We're going to get back to it. She ends up escaping with the leg injury. He gets thrown out of the car, but only has a few scratches on him. But unfortunately, at this point, it's winding down for the couple because the nation was now at a huge turning point. J. Edgar, Edgar Hoover was implementing the procedures of the FBI. Um, there was a much harsher outlook on people who committed crimes like they did, especially robbery. For some reason, back then, as, I think it was more to do with the mafia mindset because of La Costa Nostra being so prevalent back then and the veracity of their crimes scared people as it did with just people who didn't have any connections doing it. I think that's what scared police more, that they weren't organized, that they were erratic in their actions and everything they did. There, there was no... So if you know anything about criminals and crime in general, you know what an MO is. Your modus operandi. They had no MO. They didn't have a certain set place that they would rob. They didn't have the same places that they would go to over and over again. They weren't creatures of habit. They were absolutely wild. And that's what scared people. So, in reality, they were really nowhere near. And here's, we're going, getting to this again. They were nowhere near the, na the same caliber as the other callous killers on the same list. Because they were put, at, they were actually put at this point on the FBI's most wanted list when the FBI like first started. So it wasn't technically called the FBI. It was just the higher ups in Washington under the advisement of J. Edgar Hoover um, made the most wanted list. And in reality, though, they were nowhere near the same caliber as the other callous killers on the same list. The media exaggerated most of their crimes and actually attributed more elaborate heists to them. And being accused much more of they had, than they had actually done made them more wanted by the law. If they had actually only been given credit for the very few jobs that they had actually done... I don't think that I don't think that they would have ended up the way that they did. I think that there were much bigger fish to fry at that point than these two. On July 20th, 1933, police were now more heavily armed to match the firepower and they caught them in Platte City, Missouri in a hotel. Buck, who is Clyde's older brother, suffered a gunshot wound to the head, but he survived that. And Blanche was blinded by glass shrapnel. And one of the vid one of the pictures that I'll actually show you is Blanche, who is Buck's wife, after they get caught. Um, she is blinded by a piece of grass glass shrapnel from the shootout. And when the photographers and stuff actually come up onto the scene where they get apprehended later on, right after this, um she actually thinks that they're opening fire on her. She, all she sees is like a flash, so you know, the gun, the flash of a barrel that you'd see before it shoots. She actually thought that they were just going to gun her down. So you can see the look of sheer terror on this woman's face because that's what they were told to do. They were told not to take them alive. At any point, they were, they were the, the barrel gang, Bonnie and Clyde, were not to be taken alive. Shoot on sight, taken dead. There, there was no trial, there was no justice, there was no anything, there was only death for these guys. And it shows in Blanche's demeanor that it's just, it's very sad to see somebody be that fearful of our actual law enforcement. That they would think that they just open on them like a firing squad back in like the 15th century. Um, so, they escaped right after that. So they escaped the shooting, but in Iowa, only four days later, in Dexter, Iowa, actually, they were once again surrounded. And as they ran for their lives, Bonnie has to be carried by Clyde. And Buck, who is in such bad shape because of his gunshot wound to the head, gets left behind, and Blanche stays behind with him. So 
Blanche was in prison, and then Buck actually ended up dying a few days later. And keep in mind, this was in July of 1933, and they ended up dying in May of 1934. So from July to May 19 from July 1933 to May 1934, um, almost about six. No, but I guess a little bit longer than that, but. I mean, they his family waited for nine, ten months to bury him because they knew Clyde wasn't going to be far behind. They did not bury Buck until Clyde died. So this was January or July 22nd that Buck died. July 26th, I'm sorry. July 26th, Buck died in 1933, and he was not buried until the end of May in 1934 because his family knew that Clyde was right behind him and they didn't want to waste the money on two headstones because they didn't have it. So <laughs> Clyde decides that he knows where he can go and find people for his gang because now he's in need of a new gang. Everybody else is dead or imprisoned. He needs a new gang to continue on. He goes back to Eastham Prison Farm, where he was originally incarcerated, because he knows that there's the worst of the worst there. He goes, and not only does he break people out, he breaks out five inmates in this attempt, and it was successful, mind you, but these five inmates, one of them was the cause of their downfall. It was from here that the path was set in motion to their gruesome deaths because without having incorporated this particular gentleman gentleman into what they were doing, I don't believe that they would have been caught the way that they were. I think that they could have made it a lot longer than they actually ended up making it. So at this point, Lee Simmons made it his personal mission to apprehend them. And this, Lee Simmons was the sheriff of the town that Eastham Prison is in, Eastham Prison Farm is in. So at this point, it's just a personal vendetta for him. He needs to get back at these guys. And he calls in the most famous lawman in Texas, uh, Frank Hammer, who was considered to be vile and just a beast when it came down to being a marshal. He worked for the Texas Rangers for I want to say over like 15 years. So he was a Texas Ranger, you know, marshaling, catching the worst of the worst and bringing them back in. He enlisted him for this. So this is where everything starts going kind of south. Um, let me scroll down here real quick so we can just go from here. So after this, after he um, gets Frank Hammer to agree to help him, he established, and this was written and sent out across every single state, that Bonnie and Clyde and the entire Barrow gang were to be shot dead on sight. There was to be no apprehension. There was to be no trial. There was to be no day in court, which actually is against your amendment rights. You have fair to a, you have the right to a swift and speedy trial. They did not get that. They were told to shoot on sight. They weren't treated as humans anymore. They were treated as animals. They were hunted down as animals. Um. On, hey, so right after they break them out. And they have now the most infamous lawman on their tail. He actually starts to retrace their steps. And he is going through town by town, um, city by city, state by state, retracing everywhere that they could have possibly gone. Now when he comes into Louisiana, he stumbles upon Methvin's family. Um, now... 
This gentleman, Henry Methvin, was one of the convicts that they broke out. He got a clue from Methvin's family when he was in Louisiana, and in exchange for clemency, his parents actually made this whole agreement with Hamer that if they helped set them up and they helped apprehend them, that their fu their son would get full clemency across all states for everything they had done. Now, keep in mind, Henry Methvin was a murderer, a rapist. He, he was a horrible person. His rap sheet is insane. He was a much worse criminal than Bonnie and Clyde ever were, and he got clemency because they told them that they'd help him capture him. Which happens a lot in still in today's society. You'd actually be surprised how much that happens. So they um on May second, sorry, the cat's distracting me. <laughs> on May twenty second, nineteen thirty four Texas officers are actually brutally gunned down at the hands of Methvin and Clyde. But, because Methvin's um, clemency and pardoning was already going through in Texas and Louisiana, the states that he had been convicted in, they actually reached out to all media outlets before they published and said to make Bonnie the other shooter instead of Methvin. Because they had multiple eyewitness reports, they had multiple outlets reporting on this incident, and instead of reporting what they actually saw, which was Methvin and Clyde gunning down these policemen, they asked them to write in Bonnie instead. So Bonnie was, again, attributed to all of this horrible bloodshed that she actually had no real hand in. Kitty cat! Meow meow! Um... And that, that honestly just, it really makes me mad because... They knew what they were doing. They knew, no cat. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they, hi buddy. <laughs> they knew, they just, they knew that they were setting them up. They knew that they were exaggerating it and they didn't care. They didn't care that these people weren't guilty of these things. All they wanted was them dead so they could have their story. So they could sit there and say, we did it. We stopped the worst of the worst when really the worst of the worst was still out there. Um, so, on May 6th, which was only four days after this incident, in 1934, they meet with their families for the final time. His parents even told them that they didn't buy a headstone for Buck because they knew that, that he'd gone soon, that he'd be gone soon too. And that they could just share a headstone because they didn't have enough money to buy enough for two. And all he asked, he did not fight, he didn't, you know, put up any type of quarrel about it. He just said that all he wanted engraved was gone but not forgotten on his headstone. And that's all he wanted. That's all he requested of his mother. Um, then Bonnie gave her mother a poem entitled End of the Line, which is actually the video that I made for you guys that we're going to be watching after this. And it's a tribute to their crime and love. And in mid-May, they made their way to Louisiana with plans to meet Methvin's parent at Methvin's parents' house on May 23rd. And at 9 a.m., at well, they planned to meet them at 9 a.m. Uh, the trap was set up and put into place. And around 8 in the morning, they stopped seven miles outside um, of the area in Gibson, Louisiana. And that's actually at Ma Canfield's Cafe, and that's where I'm going to be doing the investigation from, is this location. Um, they had donuts and coffee, and they ordered sandwiches. Clyde ate his. Bonnie actually took hers to go, and she passed away with it in her hands. Um, the ambush was comprised of officers from both Texas and Louisiana. Sorry, guys, I gotta get the cat off the keyboard real quick. Ow! Hey, kitty cat. Okay. Mm. So, they ordered, did all that, had a wonderful breakfast together, and only to, seven miles down the road, end up with their lives taken. So, around 9.15, well, what they had done, though, to make sure that the ambush would not be compromised, that Clyde would be going slowly through the area because he was known as something of a speeder, um, 
Ivy Methvin, who is Harry Methvin's, Henry Methvin's father, parked his car on the side of the road and made it look like he was broken down and needed help so that Claude, that they would stop and help him. Around 9.15, they came around and they came around the turn and saw Ivy Methvin and he stopped to help them. What they did not know was that there were over 30 lawmen from both Texas and Louisiana all laying away in the bushes right next to them waiting to open fire. So before, go okay. cat. So they came across them, but before they could even exit the car, now this is where the overkill comes into play. And I don't mean it to be funny or anything. This was literal overkill. They did not even get out of the car before they opened fire. Now, from the report and from the autopsies, the first two rounds that entered, the first two shots that were fired, they were actually fired by Prentice Oakley, was the gentleman's name. They hit Clyde in his head. And at this point, after the first two shots were fired and he got hit in the head, his foot actually slipped off of the clutch. And keep in mind, at this point, he was probably dead already. There was no need. But he ended up with over 27 bullet wounds, and Bonnie ended up with over 50. But the car itself actually ended up with over 150 um, bullet holes altogether. That's not even counting the stray bullets that also would have ended up anywhere else but the car. Um, Clyde was probably dead on impact from the first or second bullet. His foot slipped off of the clutch, and they actually started rolling backwards into a ditch. So they were completely stopped at this point, and they were not armed. They were not armed. They were not shooting back. The officers, every single last one of them, unloaded everything that they had into them. So it's actually said that the gunfire only lasted a few seconds, and it produced over 150 bullets from all officers. Hinton's father... Um, L.J. Boots Hinton, which is the gentleman who previously owned the Ambush Museum before his passing in 2016. His father, Ted Hinton, is the sheriff from Dallas who was there and present at their murder. Now, the Dallas Times actually sat there and gave him a little 30mm uh, camera, you know, the little old fil f film reel cameras, and had... Sorry, guys, getting a lot of notifications. And had it on him for about seven months because Dallas said that I know you're going to get him. I know you're going to get him. I, I want you to take down all the film you can when you do. So he carried around this particular camera for seven months waiting for this moment. And he ended up filming the bloody carnage. He filmed everything. And it actually ended up becoming known as one of the, I had it right here, give me one second. Um, the most ill-famed film in history was the way I decided to describe it because I don't wanna say it's famous. Um, I don't think it's in good taste. I don't think that that was right of them to do. But again, a lot of people have that fascination with the death of these guys. So much so, and here we'll go again, that um, Hamer actually took all of their weapons and their fishing gear as trophies. Now, to me, that's something that a serial killer does. A serial killer takes trophies of their victims. This was a gentleman who was supposed to be an upstanding lawman. This wasn't a hunt. They're not animals. You don't take their head to stuff and put on the wall. He took their things as a trophy, as a reminder of what he did. And that, to me, was incredibly unprofessional. Again, that's what a serial killer does. That's not, that's not what a cop does. It's not what a law enforcement officer does. But he was not the only one who tried to take their possessions. He was the only one that succeeded, really, aside from a few of the people who didn't try taking the bigger items. But um, people actually f began to flock around from all over the area to see the scene and it became a free-for-all. Civilians looted items from the car, people ripped off pieces of Bonnie's blood-soaked clothing and actually tried to sell it afterwards. They ripped this poor woman's clothing off 
soaked with her and Clyde's blood. And instead, in, in those moments, when you're passing over, or when your life is taken, your life force is taken from you, that's the last thing you should have to deal with. I can only imagine the sorrow that they must have felt being made a spectacle of in their death. That's not... It's not right to do to anyone, regardless of whether they were criminals or not. That's just, it's not right. Um, this one guy actually tried cutting off Clyde's trigger finger and was stopped by the police. And then another guy tried cutting off his ear to take with him as a souvenir. Um, and then one lady actually went so far as to try and take Bonnie's wedding ring, which again was not even from Clyde. It was from her first marriage with Roy Thornton. Um, but they were actually stopped, and then the police finally kind of tried to take control of the area because it was getting to be too much, and they cleared the area out, but they, that was right before they started taking insane pictures. If you look it up yourself, you can see them all. Some of them I included in the slideshow that we'll be watching next. But, no, cat jump. By 1935, the FBI had all but slain all of the top mischief makers from their list, with Bonnie and Clyde being their first takedown. So on this whole list of, you know, the most wanted, you had Bonnie and Clyde go down first. They were the first targeted because they were the easiest. They were, again, they weren't organized, but they were also the scariest to everybody because they were wild. Now, 1935, which is a year later after they die, everybody on their list had been taken out. Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, all the other parts of the mob that they wanted gone, were gone. Um, and thousands of onlookers gathered. If you look up the footage from their actual funeral, it's insane to see how many people showed up. But it's also very sad because you see their families actually trying to mourn and have a private moment. And nothing was private about this. There were multiple things stolen from both of their um, funeral services. And their families. Bonnie's, Bonnie's mother was actually so upset at Bonnie. And so upset at Clyde for taking Bonnie. That she was actually said that she he had my daughter in life. He cannot have her in death. So instead of being buried together. Instead of having a funeral together. They not only had their funeral services three miles away from each other in the middle of downtown Dallas, but they're also buried about seven miles away from each other in separate cemeteries with their each of their families, respectively. Um, so, uh, choosing each other so voraciously in life, only to be split apart eternally, must be heartbreaking. But not only did Clyde end up actually sharing a headstone with his brother Buck, his family honored his wishes, and those words still ring true about both of them to this day. Gone, but not forgotten. Some, it's, an, it's crazy that he wanted that on his headstone, because it's like he knew the impact that he was leaving on this world. He knew that his story was going to resonate with somebody out there. He knew that he and Bonnie were bigger than life, because he knew what they made them. It was all by the accounts of law enforcement and media. If it weren't for them, they wouldn't have had near as much fame and notoriety as they did. So, if you guys have any questions that you want me to ask, <coughs> pardon, when I am out at the Ambush Museum and out of their marker when I'm trying to channel and communicate with them, go ahead, let me know. Drop it in the comments, um, or again, message me whenever you have a chance. If you want to ask something private that you don't necessarily want everybody else to see. We're going to go ahead and switch over to the watch party. And I'm going to show you, watch, or uh, go through with you guys and watch the end of the line video that I made for you. Which includes the poem that Bonnie gave to her mother in their last meeting. It's the story of Bonnie and Clyde. So... Thank you guys. Remember, if you want to learn the secrets to the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Have a good night.